Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the director and stars of the new film, To Dust. In it, the incredible Geza Rorig plays a Hasidic Jewish man who, following the death of his wife, becomes spiritually troubled and obsessed with what happens to the body after burial. In an attempt to ease his troubles, he enlists a local science teacher, played by Matthew Broderick. It's a hilarious, beautiful, and wonderful film with two perfect performances at the center. Let's take a look. You are a scientist? I'm a science teacher. I have questions. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to be of service to you, Rabbi. I'm not a rabbi. My wife, she died. I fear her soul is suffering until she returns to the earth. What's to become of her body? They use pigs. They most closely resemble people. The body is reduced to tiny bits of skin and bone. And how long does this take? Well, I suppose one could bury a pig. I don't imagine that that's a... Um, kosher? I buried the pig. We're having office hours here. I just realized nobody knows where I am. Should have left a note. This is unscientific at best. You mean a pig more like your wife. No offense. Oh, Will this make you better? I hope it will. I'm here to see Schmel. He's a friend of mine, a, uh, a business friend. Look, it's a body farm in Tennessee. What's a body farm? We have on our hands a woman. She was buried six feet under back in June. What's that body going to look like right about now? Where did you say you were from? His blood is on our hands. His mud is on my carpet. What are you after, Smell? What is this all about? I don't know. What's your friend's name? Uh, Schmel. Schmuel. Jesus loves you, Schmel Schmuel. Everybody from To Dust, please put your hands together for Matthew Broderick, Geza Rorig, and director Sean Snyder. Hey. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, congratulations on this film. I've seen it a couple times. I love it. It's beautiful. It's deadpan and hilarious. Uh, I think at no point while you're watching it does do you does it go where you expect it to go. And every time it goes into a crazier, more absurd place, it remains grounded and and heartfelt. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, I want to know how did this start though? Where where did you come up with with this idea? It's not in any way the kind of idea, with the exception of mi it maybe being a buddy comedy in some ways, is it any kind of other movie that I've seen? I say that it's a, um, a Hasidic scientific Borscht Belt B-horror buddy dramedy about grief with a handful of decaying pigs. How many uh, rooms did you pitch that in until someone gave you money? <laughs> I think it came up after the fact. Right. You have to, you have to pitch it once it's made. <laughs> um, I, the, the earliest seeds were emotional. I lost my mom 10 years ago um, to cancer. I, I come from a Reformed Jewish background, which is certainly not a, a Hasidic Jewish background, though that's somewhere in the lineage. Um, I uh, have always believed that, that you know, Jewish mourning, um, well, uh, it's incredibly beautiful and it's incredibly profound and um, well ancient, it's also very wise about, uh, you know, and intuitive about our understanding of grief, and it's very, very life-affirming um, in the face of loss. And it allows for this, this uh, brief period of sort of excessive grief before it, you know, hopes to rein it in and bring you back to the world of the living. Um, uh, but nonetheless, from within the, you know, the um, darker moments of my own grief after my mom passed away, I felt, uh, well, it was beautiful to be honoring her through these rituals and to be mourning along with my family through these rituals that my own grief was manifesting in its own ways and sort of needing its own forms of expression and spilling outside the boundaries of those confines. I think that, that grief, you know, as, as I came to, to learn personally, is as idiosyncratic um, as the relationship between the person who's been lost and the person who's left behind. And it uh, should... Uh, honor uh, the person who's been lost in that very specific way, and it should 
assist the person who's been left behind as long as it doesn't uh, hurt anybody else. Uh, I think spilling outside the boundaries is sort of the exact, the best way to describe what happens in this movie is that his grief begins spilling outside of the boundaries within his family and within the other people that he sort of meets to, to, to create, to set, set the story in motion. Um, Geza uh, starred in a film called Son of Saul, which is, in my estimation, one of the great movies uh, of the past 10, 15 years. Uh, it's entirely focused on his face <laughs> from minute one till the closing minute. Uh, and I revealed someone who was sort of almost born to be on camera, I think, for people who, who saw it. Did you know him prior to, to, to seeing that film? Did you see that film and cast him for this? No, Geza and I uh, share a mutual friend at uh, Sony Pictures Classics, and uh, he's a, a dear mentor. Um, and, and champion of mine. And I had finished the script right around the same time that they purchased Son of Saul out of Cannes. Um, and uh, our, our friend was trying to connect us for, for months. He said, you have to see this movie. So I only know Ge knew Geza, uh, the lore of Geza because of, of, of this film before I actually got to see the film, before I actually got to meet Geza. Um, I did get to see a, a press screening of the film before it came out. And I feel that uh, I'm the only cinema-going human in, in who, who watched that film trying to wonder whether or not uh, Geza could be funny. Um, Everybody else is shaken and disturbed and crying, and you're sitting there, I, I just don't see it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, well, I, well I, I knew, I mean, that face. Geza is a face that, that deserves to be on a big screen. Um, and it's funny, because even you, you even forget it. You're in the editing room for months and months and months, and you're watching it on a small monitor. And then finally, when you, you project it, if he moves his eyes a, a millimeter, you see a whole world uh, shift. And I mean, that's why I'm so grateful that this film is getting a theatrical release. I mean, that's the, that's the dream of any, of any filmmaker. But there's a lot of reasons why I think this film specifically you know, it plays on, on a big screen and with, with an audience. Um, from Son of Saul, I knew that Geza could dig, and that was certainly required. Um, I didn't know if he could uh, speak the amount of English we were going to put into his mouth because he's very silent in that film. But I also knew that there was a Chaplin-esque quality to his performance in that film, both in its, in its humorous, uh, clown-like ways, but also in its humanity. And then we met, and um, Geza is himself, uh, very devout and, and religious, and our script dabbles in, in blasphemy while never intending to disrespect, and I held my breath uh, for a week uh, until he returned <laughs> the phone call having read the script, because if he didn't like it, it didn't only mean that we wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to work with him, it would mean that we were getting it wrong on the page. And he responded positively, and, and, and that, you know, we had about a, a year, year and a half of getting to get to know each other and spend time um, and I believe that, that for many reasons, you know, that, that Geza might discuss that he, there's nobody else who could have or should have played this role. Well, Geza, I'm curious, you know, when people talk about an actor in the way that we've just talked about you, in the way that you have a face built for camera, your presence does this, and your, perform your performances are like this, it's almost as if it's all these innate natural qualities that you're not necessarily calibrating and bringing a performance uh, intellectually to the screen as well. But you clearly are, yet, you weren't necessarily an actor prior to Son of Saul, right? You had essentially quit acting. Yeah, I, I had a punk band in my late teenage years for years, and I was um, performing in front of quite big audiences. So I think performing and being a lead singer of a band is sort of acting, right? So that was my first exposure to this. And, and then you're right, some decades went on without acting at all. And then Son of Saul, out of the blue, put me on the map. And I don't, you know, I, I like acting a whole lot, but I also do write. It's not the only thing I do. And so I, I'm quite selective when it comes to acting. I'm really looking for roles that I feel like, you know, it's, it's not just sort of me, but like I can feel like I re really can bring that character alive. And which wasn't hard in this case. Uh, as soon as I read the script with my wife, we were blown away by how how interesting and unique is this. And 
Yeah, so so then of course later on, like a good year after when I learned and met Matthew, and because that's the whole thing. If if I can be good or Matthew can be good as well, but if you're not good together in this movie, then it's it's not gonna work. And thank God it, it worked out from the get go that somehow, just by who we are, we are different, but yet there must be some deep seated, what is it? sympathy or attraction that be, that it works in a, in a very interesting way yeah you clearly share something and it comes across on camera whether it's sharing being able to share a sense of humor whether there's a joke on screen or not it does seem like the two of you enjoy each other's presence while performing um matthew what drew you to this movie and you can also be quite picky as well as Geza said that he is you look down your body of work you do theater quite often you seem to be fairly choosy in the projects that you take part in as well yeah um, it's depending on the, on the year, but uh, yeah, I usually am choosy. Um, uh, I just read this script and uh, really enjoyed reading it. I thought it was uh, original and personal. You know, I could, you could it didn't seem like a formula. It seemed like uh, something that was sort of deeply felt by somebody, and um, turned out to be John and Jason. But I didn't know that at the time, and. Um, and I wanted to work with Geza. I, I had seen Son of Saul, and I thought it was brilliant. And um, so that was exciting. And I knew the producer. I, I knew Emily Mortimer. Oh, and Alessandro Navola, yeah. Yeah, I know both of them. And um, they were quite forceful. And, um, you know, it shot in Staten Island, which isn't too far. <laughs> so <laughs> Paid a lot. Paid a huge amount. I think lunch. I got lunch. Um, <laughs> no, it was... Uh, I liked the story and I liked the part. I liked him when I met him and uh, I wanted to work with him. He said that uh, when the two of you met, it was pretty clear that uh, you would work together well. Was that clear to you as well? And, and, and how often do you feel that when you meet somebody that you're gonna be sharing the screen with? Well, I, I usually, I might feel it, but you never really know. I mean, until you really see the movie in a way or, uh, it might feel good while you're shooting it and still not really translate, but... The big difference between a play and a movie. Was yeah, great. and the feeling of doing it and what it looks like. Yeah. Um, but I, I did have an easy... From the time we started reading scenes together, the three of us would meet and uh, just very informally around the table. And um, it felt right. You know, it felt like two very different people, but alike enough that they could uh, communicate. And we, we had an easy, easy rapport. Yeah. Um, and the writing. Prior to uh, Matthew's character's appearance, it's a fairly somber film. I mean, there is the sort of Chaplin-esque quality of, of, of Geza's performance. But I think when, uh, when Matthew's character shows up, we really, it's almost like when we're allowed to la start laughing a little bit, the idea of it being a dry comedy really comes forward. At what point did you come up with this idea for this teacher to be a part of it and sort of recognize that there was going to be a buddy comedy element to it? Uh, it's, it's been a, a, a privilege to be able to watch the movie traveling with festivals uh, with different audiences, and it's always unpredictable when the first laugh is going to happen. When do you find it? When do you find it happens? At its at its earliest, um, it's immediately after her her death when he's trying to ritually tear his his coat, and struggles with that. Um, it truly uh, kicks in at the first bacon joke. Um, which is about, you know, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes in, into the movie. Um, but it's, you know, when, when I speak about seeing it in a, in a theater, there's something about the catharsis of being with an audience and one person laughs and another person laughs uncomfortably, but the audience informs the audience that it's okay to laugh as the film slowly reveals itself. But there is this Russian doll quality to it to, to some extent where, you know, it's, it's bookended by gravitas and, it, and you know, gravitas is, runs through it. And I think um, sincerity and earnestness runs through the film, but it delves into depths of absurdity before it, you know, <laughs> the grave of absurdity well, before like coming a, out of it. A Jarmusch like quality to the absurdity, where everybody is remaining somewhat somber and dry while at the same time he's wearing a woman's robe or saying something along the lines of, I think my favorite line in the movie is, we need a pig that's more like your wife, no offense, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and a burial that's more like a Jew, no offense, right? Yeah. Something like that. It's such a great line, but you deliver it without hamming it or without delivering it as 
as, as absurd as it is. Yeah, yeah, they they both find themselves in a in a very awkward situation, and uh, even what language to use when talking about uh, death and Judaism, and particularly with a rabbi with a big hat, you know, you're very intimidating. And uh, uh, Albert is somebody who doesn't really know how he's supposed to behave around uh, a cantor at all. He's clearly at a low point as He's well. at a low point, and yeah, and uh, I mean, he verges on not caring about anything, it seems. But as the, as the film continues, he does start to get more human and more interested in what, what Gaze is going through, what Shmuel is going through. And I don't know that it's only the, the culture class. I feel like we're, there's an awkwardness in life as we tiptoe around grief yeah. and the aggrieved and the bereaved. And that awkwardness, you know, it's about the absurdity and the not knowing what to say and the struggles. And, and I mean, people, people laugh at... It's the rare yeah. person who knows what to say in a, yeah. in a situation of grief. And then everybody afterwards likes to pretend like they know what to say. Like, oh, just make sure you do this and do this. Yeah. But then they show up and they're just as awkward as anybody else. Yeah. No one knows I, what to do. And I learned, you know... Being aggrieved myself, that you that you forgive that awkwardness. Sometimes it it stings, but you you forgive it because everyone's as in the movie. I think everyone is coming from a place of of good intention in the face of this man who's just lost. Yeah, and one of the one of my favorite por portions of the movie is the relationship that you uh, your character has with his children, and as his children sort of grow more concerned over um, his well-being. Can you talk about developing the relationship with those child actors? They're phenomenal. Um, yeah, they, they are really good. Um, you see, there is a scene on the lake, if you recall, and it's nothing less than sort of a light child abuse that's going on with the best intention. He wants the kids to be able to talk to their mother, but he's getting very pushy and angry. And I think that it's really good that it's written in that way because we didn't want Shmuel to, to make Shmuel sort of like a saint. You know, he, 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 he's a real guy, sort of a one of us and an average Joe in the Hasidic world. There was a lot of conversation I had with Sean and the co-writer Jason Begay about really the character of Shmuel, should he be more like scholarly, like sort of like a Kabbalist, like a mystic, so... Or, and then we sort of ended up somehow, he's not the, a village idiot, and he's not a scholar, he's somewhere in between, a sort of an enigmatic figure. It's, it's, you can't really feel like you, you, you know him or understand him all the way. He's an but average you sympathize, person. Yes, he's an average person, but you, you, you really truly sympathize with the genuinity of, of, of his intention, which is also shifts. You see, he starts out in this selfless way, like, you know, I'm here to help her, but it becomes dangerous at one point. If you remember that scene when he says, I just want her to be God. Like, like it, this is like threatening. This, is, this is, takes me down, too, too, too down, and I, I have two kids and, and I have to take care of. So there's a beautiful arc in how, and the movie is, I think, is a story of a healing. There's a saying, uh, you know, people used to say that God is, God is in, in, inside of us. And then someone I like said, no, no, God is really truly between us. If it's inside of us, then how is it going to relate? You know, God is in between us. And that is why I think one of the biggest help for someone who is going through such a loss is to form relationships, either the ones he or, he or she had already and to renew and deepen them or to find new relationships as well. Yeah, I love that scene um, on the on in the lake because uh, I don't think I've ever seen a, a scene in a movie that deals with grief like that, where someone is frustrated with their children or their family members because they are not grieving as intensely as as they are, and they're supposed to be the parent and they're supposed to be the one who can take care of all this stuff, but the children are actually seemingly more equipped to be able to do that. In this and you remember that line that she's saying when he's dating first time, and, and, and she says, you know, children mourn well, but they are stronger than us. Yeah. You know, going back to the humor of the film, I'm wondering, I always get curious about this when you're making a movie, how confident directors are when they're shooting scenes. You have these, you have a very specific tone that the film finds, which I imagine you find a lot in editing, but while you're shooting it, you have to direct it that way as well. 
did you find yourself getting different kinds of takes or getting some of the more humorous lines bigger or smaller just to make sure you had options in the editing room? I don't know that we had that, that luxury. I mean, in, in the moments that we, that we did, um, I feel we, we played with it. I think that a lot of the, you know, as a director, if, you, if you're sort of watching, you know, with, with a, a, I had a, a directing professor who said, you know, a, a BS meter for truth, you know? That it was just like, are we, are we playing the joke with a wink? Or are we playing the joke with emotional honesty? Is it organic to the situation? Or is it uh, a top of or commenting on the situation? And I think that, that you know, you're trying to, to level the playing field and uh, you know, make it consistent in that way. Um, that even as it gets absurdist and surrealist, it's always coming from a place of, of emotional honesty. And that the funniest thing isn't secondary uh, or uh, followed up with this, the most tragic thing, but that they're contained in the same moment. Um, this film was always this, this tonal tightrope. Uh, I knew it was darkly comic from the moment that, that I conceived of it, and when I brought it to my writing partner, Jason Begay, as we, were, as we were writing it, I think we found that it was more outright comic than, than we initially believed. But you're in these... You're, you're in the vacuum of my own sense of humor, the vacuum of, of our dual sense of humor, and you're not so sure it's going to play wider. And I, I don't know for sure if it was until we really put it in front of its premier audience where there was this sigh of, sigh of relief that, that we had found a, a kindred sensibility. But in terms of finding that, that tone, um, we had talked about it while we were uh, rehearsing and, and just reading through the script and talking about it, and it, and it was Matthew as, as this this veteran, uh, you know, who said, we leap and we find it. You know, a lot of these, the, you, you, we know the guidelines, we know the emotional truths, and we just see what happens. And, and um, I don't know, it's, you know, that's the beauty of, of film as well. It's, it's raw and real and fast-paced and ever-evolving. And uh, you're uh, really satisfied and validated when you end up with a film that, that echoes the film that you wrote, but you're also... Uh, delighted and validated and, and uh, grateful that it's evolved past that. It's a near impossibility ways. that any movie gets made. It's an even greater impossibility that it reflects in any way what you initially wrote. So yeah. congrats. Uh, are you that kind of actor, Matthew, that is just sort of like, let's dive in and see and see and find the tone? Or are you someone who is very, asks lots of questions and is trying to figure it out up until the last minute? It depends, you know. Sometimes I'm, I've been both, um, but there is always some point when you have to stop asking questions and and thinking and jump in, you know. So you do as much preparation as you can, and but once it feels pretty solid, you have to sort of, in my opinion, everybody's different, but. Uh, you almost forget all of that. You know, you, even on the stage, some acting teacher said, you know, you do all the preparation, but when you open the door to come in, leave it all, it's all gone. It's just what happens now. So the more alive it is, I don't mean to sound, this might sound pretentious, I don't know, but uh, you have to be willing at some point to uh, just do what's actually happening on that day at that moment, not what you planned. I think we have some time for questions from the audience. Who has a, hi, right here. Hi, um, first of all, thank you for the movie. I really enjoyed it. I saw it on Sunday. Um, my question is, did you improvise a lot in scenes together or you just follow the script? Mm -hmm. And do you have any funny story from the set maybe? I don't think we improvised no, barely yeah, at all. Almost. No, it is, you see, this movie was very ambitious to make. It's it's a low-budget movie, and we had so many pages of the script to cover each day. I don't think we had time for that. And it wasn't really necessary. I think for the after day one or two, it, it felt right, and we just trusted uh, uh, doing it right, jumping in. We would try different ways to do a scene, but never changed the, the dialogue was all from the script that they wrote, all of it, yeah. Funny stories. stories. Well, I almost killed you. He almost, he almost killed me, N not on purpose, right? Or, uh, or destroyed your voice box. You no, know, it was fine. He, he was uh, 
tr throwing some uh, a stick, I think it was, and uh, it got caught in his hand or whatever. It didn't go up. It went straight. I was off camera, so I was just doing my, I was, the lens was here, and I was just watching the scene and giving my lines, and Permanent suddenly, mark. and it hit me uh, right here. And he said, "Are you are you okay?" I, I paused because like, no, I didn't I'm actually okay. I didn't actually see it happen. Yeah, I, I thought you were really channeling some emotion in that moment. Yeah, and but I, I, I was realized. thinking, is my voice permanently ruined? So, uh, there were, but it wasn't. It was fine. There were. It, there were. It was very, very. He felt very bad, and I felt bad that he felt bad. And then, and then that next take really. You know, yeah. you channeled all of that. And I had a plastic uh, screen <laughs> up for that next thing. I've been apologizing I, since then. I, the rest of your life, you'll be apologizing. You know, that was, that was a night where I wasn't sure you were going to come back. No, The no. next day. And yet, he, and yet you did. I, not only the next day, I kept working that night. That's the kind of yeah, professional like, I am. Yeah. We, were, yeah, we were discussing about, you know, trying to call it. Uh, Sounds funny, but imagine it. it it was very close it, 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 to being bad. You know, it yeah. wasn't as funny as it sounds. And you have one of those. You have one of those awful Time plus you get, comedy is funny. Yeah. Is, yeah where you get like. hit with something, whether it's in the face or in the neck, there's that initial moment of like, oh my <laughs> god, I'm so mad, and everyone's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And yes. Like, oh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm it's mind. true. I'm uh, anything to the face or head or that area makes you instantly in a rage. Rage. Yeah. And then you have to go. I'm sorry that I yelled at you guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Even if your little two-year-old punches you right in the nose, you think, "Oh, you goddamn wonder." <laughs> yeah. you, what am I? No, I didn't. You, did, you didn't yell at Gaza, but maybe that's because you couldn't. No, I moment. I counted to ten and didn't yell. Yeah. And we've talked about this longer than you probably want. <laughs> Next question, right here. This question is for Sean. Um, my question is, what is the life experience that had the most impact? For you, and how did it, and that, um, how did it shape you as a director? I'm not sure about about a, a specific life experience, um, but I do think that there's something cumulative. Uh, and I'm 37. I didn't go to film school until I was 30. I, but I knew from the age of five that I wanted to to make movies. Um, there was a long circuitous road. I wrote scripts in my early 20s that were navel gazing and and um, all too uh, autobiographical on the surface in that way that they're not really autobiographical because you're your own PR agent and those will never see the light of day. And I was a musician throughout my 20s, um, uh, a singer-songwriter, which is, was also a dream that I had from, from the time that I was five. Uh, instead of going to film school, I went uh, uh, to, I just really felt that a liberal arts education was important and I studied religion not because it was practical in any way to study religion, but because there was an instant draw to that based on my own religiosity, you know, which is a reformed Jewish background, um, but my own sort of searching and weaving in and out of that, uh, you know, waxing and waning in terms of how I, I, I felt in relationship to, to my faith and always searching for my own personal meaning um, atop or aside that. And then in my... Uh, in the middle, my mid twenties, I lost my mom, and there was this—I don't know—that you know—that is a, a paradigm-shifting moment uh, in life. And there's sort of before my mom passed away and after my mom passed away, and there was something when my mom passed away that instantly said, "You know, I think I think I want to pivot towards film now." And on one sense, there was an existential carpe diem quality to that—that uh, that like time's a waste and pursue your dream. And on the other sense you know, a wash in, in the grief after my mom passed away, those emotions did not fit neatly into rhyming, punny couplets <laughs> and folk songs. Um, uh, film and scripts and, and felt like a, a more apt place to, to process those things. Uh, I also imagine you were a better writer at that point, not just because you had found a, a, a more metaphorical use to tell a story, or more meta a better metaphor to tell a story, but you were just more acquainted with how to sit down and how to finish something you were writing. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, that's, it's always a, an evolving process of self-doubt and confidence and, you know, shifting measure. But in I, your early 20s, when you get yeah. some of that self-doubt, you're like, oh, screw this. I'll yeah. write something different. And then when you're in your 30s, you're like, oh, I'm 30. I should probably finish this thing that I started. Yeah, and, and I, had a, I have a daughter who's about to turn four. She's almost the exact same age as the film, conceived when she was conceived. Um, uh, and I don't know, that, there's something about that that says, okay, it's time to, to finish it. And it's time to focus. I think the movie is more life-affirming and finished because she exists in this world. 
But I, but I would say I, I delved into, um, sorry, this is a very long-winded answer. I, I, I delved into you know, a lot more character study-based stuff while I was in film school. And when this idea was unlocked, and it was unlocked through this notion of thinking about science and science and storytelling, grateful to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation who helped incubate the idea. Um, and all of a sudden, the most autobiographical idea that was personal and emotional and dark and deep and a product of all of those latent threads from the very circuitous journey that brought me to film. I think Shmuel's a cantor because I was a singer instead of a rabbi. My, my interests in religion and spirituality, this question of science, and, and to dust also allowed me to go back to, to younger film instincts, to, to, to the love of genre, to the love of, of comedy. And so the movie, while I'm not a Hasidic cantor grieving my, my w lost wife, is so intensely autobiographical and only a product of, of not jumping the gun and going to film school as an undergrad and trying to make a movie right away. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, <clears throat> so um, Lion King is my favorite Disney movie ever. Uh, and thank you for being a part of that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wondering for a anybody uh, up there if uh, do you have another character or if there's any characters that through the years you've seen that you would have loved to be able to voice or upcoming characters that you would want to be a part of? Like cartoon characters? Yeah, mean? like live action. Animated. Oh, animated, sorry, yes. Oh, yeah. What animated character do you want Is to that do? Me? Is that anybody. For, any, for anybody. Come on. <laughs> what animal are you? <laughs> um, uh, a beaver? I don't know. I'm, I, a beaver, ladies and gentlemen. Or, yeah. <laughs> Pig, pig, Peppa, Peppa, the, the pig. I'm a lion. I'm, I, don't, I, I was a lion. Now, the once and future. No, I'm a, a cat. I'm an aging cat. That's an amazing question, and, and uh, I'm stumped. Uh, we'll have to t take it offline. You said beaver. Yeah, you, I, that, you're yeah, stuck. Out, out, out of to sheer it? comic instinct. I don't. I would hold it. Yeah. Hold beaver. I think we have time for one more. Right here. Um, hi. My question is for Matthew. Um, as an actor myself trying to make it in the business, uh, once you made it, what do you think um, is the key to maintaining longevity in the business? Um, I don't really, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I've always worked hard and uh, try to do not repeat yourself too much and not do too far outside of yourself so that it looks, you know, that it's uh, not believable, but to try to grow, I guess, so you're not just uh, stuck in one thing. You know, I, I tried to do theater and film at the same time so that if something didn't work out, I could work in another area. And I've stayed friends with people who, who write and direct and figure maybe they'll give me a job someday, so. There's various ways to, you know, try to stay connected to uh, to theater or film, and uh, and hopefully it lasts a long time. Is it fair to say you were doing theater and film at the same time prior to that? Because we've had, we have this point right now in where like you can do TV, you can do film, you can do theater. Yeah. But even in the '90s, it was kind of like you're a movie star, yeah, or you're a theater you star, do you're a TV, TV star. And still be, yeah. Whereas you were kind of doing theater and and were also a movie star before anybody was really kind of dabbling in both. Yeah, I started that. Um. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but I, I uh, what happened is I auditioned for plays and movies and t anything I could, I was trying to get any job, probably like you are, and, and uh, I got cast in a play, Torch Song Trilogy, and uh, while I was doing that, uh, a director cast me in a movie, so it wasn't my plan, but, and then I did a Neil Simon play, and, and then another movie, so it all started at exactly the same time. So I had no desire to give either of them up, you know? Uh, it was, so it wasn't some big plan. I just, uh, that's how it happened. I was very lucky because I love plays and movies too. So I got to do both. You have one that you like more than the other? Not really. They're different. I mean, maybe the theater is a little more uh, for an actor, like satisfying in some way. But on the other hand, I love... Um, the kind of attention you can pay to little scenes in a film and 
they don't just fly by. You get to really think about them and you don't, and it sounds silly, but the fact that you don't have to speak loud makes it different. It's a very different feeling. Yeah. In a play, you're always concerned that things are readable or hearable. Uh, and um, that's... Finding an authenticity even while projecting... Right, which is nice. Way. I love that too. But sometimes it's very nice to have a camera just come here and just talk the way we're talking and not have to be concerned with that other part. Yeah, I bet that, or I imagine that that really affects how you go into theater performances afterwards, too, because so often acting teachers are teaching to just sort of be as natural and be as normal yeah. as possible, whereas if you're always performing in the theater, you don't have that moment where yeah. you actually have to be. Yeah, I never really felt a difference doing it, but that that's true. And uh, I've even done some movies where the director will be like, you're talking too loud. But sometimes I do movies and people are so quiet, I'm like, I don't know what, where, when I'm supposed to speak because I cannot hear anything you're saying. <laughs> you know, another actor would be like, well, I'm, I'm sure that I would have known that way and I didn't go there and I said. I didn't do that. Did is, I? is he done? Is Did he I do that? Did I do no, that? not you. You, I always could tell. I could tell he'd stop talking. It's my turn to talk. That's the important <laughs> thing. Um, I have a I have an esoteric question before I let you guys go. Uh, you know, before you came on, I was looking at your IMDb and one of the things that I saw was, oh, hello. And I had no, and it says uncredited. And I had seen that show twice on Broadway. I thought it was the yeah. most hilarious subversion of Broadway plays Me too. sort of ever done. <laughs> but in on the Netflix special, you appear in a doorway yeah. very briefly as Nick Kroll is exiting or re-entering the stage. Yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? Well, I saw the play on Broadway, and I did. You know, they would have somebody from the audience, a celebrity, come and be their guest for a while, and, the, and I did that. So I got to chat with them backstage, and then when they did the Netflix version of it, they said, I, I can't exactly remember. There's some scene where there's, they keep saying, Nathan Lane will be on later at the, in, the, in the Broadway show, they, and they never open the door. They just forget about it, I guess was the joke. But in the film version, they wanted to leave the stage and have whoever they'd been talking about just be behind this door, having never been let onto the stage. I think that was the, the joke. So. But I was very happy to work with those two guys, you know? It was yeah. so funny. Um, speaking of funny, To Dust, I love it. It's such a beautiful film. Congratulations, it opens this Friday. Uh, where can audiences see it? Um, this Friday in New York, City Cinema Village East. Um, and then we're rolling out nationally over the course of the next few months in L.A. Uh, and beyond next week. And, and we have release dates uh, heading into March. So please keep an eye on it. Uh, visit www.gooddeedentertainment.com slash to dust if you want to keep tabs. Everybody give them a huge round of applause. Thank you. Mm -hmm.